Good morning, everybody. So great to have you here today. Uh, really, I'm glad that you would choose to worship with us today at One Life. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Alan, and I'm the pastor here, and I'm glad that you uh, are here today. God has you here for a reason, and I hope that that will be very, very clear to you today as we continue a series that we started last week. Our series is called Without a Doubt. And the fact of the matter is that all of us deal with doubts, right? There wouldn't be anybody in the room that hasn't doubted uh, something about your life, particularly maybe about your faith, maybe about what God says in his word. Um, and, and so we want to sort of step into some of those conversations. Today in particular, we're going to sort of address the question, can I trust the Bible. Can I trust what God says in his word? Now, for some of you, that may be just a, a matter that got settled quite some time ago, right? Uh, for some of you, if you're honest, you may from time to time even continue to read the Bible and maybe you come across something and you think, man, is that for real? Is that really how that happened? Can, can that really be true of my life? I mean, maybe that was true back then for them, but maybe, maybe in our world today, is this something that we can lean into or not? And so we kind of want to address that issue today. Can I trust the Bible? We started last week with a verse that I want to show you again this week from Luke 24, verses 38 and 39. And this was Jesus after his resurrection talking to some of his disciples that had gathered there with him. And he said, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And what I want you to notice is that these were Jesus' disciples. They spent three years with God in the flesh. And they were still uncertain and questioning and had doubts arise in their hearts. And Jesus shows up. He says, here I am. Here's evidence. Here's proof. Lean into this. Touch me. Feel me. And you will see that this is the real deal. And so this morning, I just want to recognize, you know, there may be some sitting in the room today that you walk in and you've, there are a lot of doubts in your life. Doubts about all kinds of things. Um, that's normal. It's okay. What we're going to try to do uh, in love and hopefully with all the grace that we can possibly muster that comes from God to us is, is to push you toward a walk of faith. To say, listen, we're here to walk with you. We've been there. We're all there together. Let's, let's move forward. Let's see what God has to say. Let's work at it and see what we can put into practice in our lives. Um, so I want to ask you to do something, though. As we kind of go through our study today, I want to ask you to... Give the Bible the benefit of the doubt. And what I mean by that is, don't come to the Bible assuming it's wrong or assuming there's error. Give it the benefit of the doubt. Let, let's test it. Let's see what it says. Let's test it out and, and let's put it into practice and then we'll see what happens. I think what you'll find is that we have ample evidence as Christ followers. We have ample evidence uh, to, to demonstrate that trusting the Bible... It's not silly. It's not for people who are just simple-minded uh, or who have been brainwashed. Certainly, this wouldn't be a church where we would ask you to come in and just kind of put your brain at the door, you know, and come on in, and then we're going to, you know, just dump all kinds of religious, you know, mumbo-jumbo at you and then grab your brain on your way out. Not at all. Uh, we believe that Christianity and being a Christ follower involves both faith and reason, right? Both faith and reason are part of the life that we live. And so uh, let's, let's talk about this question. Can I trust the Bible? Let me just go ahead and give you the answer. It's yes. I can back up and slow down. And write, you can write that down if you want. Ready? Can I trust the Bible? Yes, you can. And um, if anybody asks you why, just tell them my pastor said so, and that should, that should settle it, right? Not really. Um, we want to go a little bit more in depth. And so the first thing I want to talk to you about, what, why? I want to give you some reasons why. Why can you trust the Bible? Okay. Uh, the first reason I want to give you is this. It is textually preserved. Textually preserved. This first part, I don't think it's going to be real technical, but I'm going to just kind of throw a lot of things at you. By textually preserved, here's what I mean. 
What I mean is, what we have today when we hold the Bible is a, a faithful, accurate uh, re- record of what God actually said to the writers when they wrote the text originally. Right? It has been textually preserved for us. Let's look at a couple of verses. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And then we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. But beginning in 2 Peter or 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, I want you to see what the Bible says about itself. Uh, it says, all scripture, so that'd be all of God's word that's been written down for us, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word means breathed out. It was breathed out by God. And that's really important. I'll tell you why in just a second. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And here's the purpose, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the key thing I want you to grab here, scripture comes from God. It was breathed out by him. Okay. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. 2 Peter 1 and verse 20. And we'll read verse 21 also. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke, now this last part's really important, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So here's what we learn as we uh, sort of take in what God says about his own word. It, It means that the Bible, it comes from God. It comes by means of the Holy Spirit through men And it's about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's all pointing to him from beginning to end. So it comes from God, by the Holy Spirit, through men, all about Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what the Bible says about itself. And we want to talk about that the rest of the day and kind of give you... Uh, don't panic. Not all day. Maybe maybe less than all day, right? But for the next few moments, um, I want you to know this. And, and for some of you, this will be review, right? But maybe for some of you who have become Christ followers in the last few months or maybe last couple years, maybe we haven't talked about this recently as much. The Bible, uh, the word Bible actually means book, right? Bible means book. It comes from a Greek word, biblios or biblos. Uh, it means book. And, and it's actually a collection of books, right? How many books are in the Bible? Anybody know? 66, right? Uh, is it 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, New Testament? And these are actually, some of them we would call books. I mean, they're pretty, pretty big, pretty lengthy. Uh, we have several, especially in the New Testament, letters. We have a collection here of poems and also prophecies. And they're all bound up today in what we call the book, the Bible, 66 books that have been uh, brought together uh, by God in his providence. This book was written over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different men on three different continents in three different languages. Why does that matter? Well, that's important because uh, when you think about, if you were to read just from beginning to end, there is a continuity of message, of theme, of purpose in this book that I believe um, is impossible when you consider that it was written by 40 different people on different continents over 1,600 years. I mean, it's hard enough to carry a theme, you know, throughout a five-paragraph paper in school, right, and get that done well, let alone something that uh, we have here in the Bible. Uh, As I mentioned to you, it's about Jesus, really our relationship with God, God's relationship with man through Jesus Christ. Here's a summary of the whole Bible if you ever kind of wondered what it was about. Maybe this is your first time in church or first time in church in a long time, you know, and you're trying to feel like, whoa, talking about the Bible is a good place to start. What's this really about anyway? Well, it begins with creation, right? In the beginning, we talked about that last week. God created the heaven and the earth. And and real quickly, you get to Genesis chapter 3, and what happens in Genesis chapter 3 is something that we call the fall, where sin entered into the world. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and so they fell in relation to God. They fell away from him in their relationship. Sin entered into the world and certainly complicated matters. Well, then pretty much the rest of the Old Testament, pretty quickly in the book of Genesis, you run into God's relationship with a nation called Israel. In fact, he had a relationship with them before they were actually a nation, right? He chose Abraham. 
who had a son named Isaac, had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They became the children of Israel. Eventually they went to Egypt and they became a nation there and God brought them out, went into Palestine and uh, the rest is history, right? And so the rest of the Old Testament is sort of about God's relationship with Israel and that he was working to bring the Messiah who would uh, correct, so to speak, this matter of sin that happened all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Well, then you get in the New Testament and Jesus, show, sure enough, shows up. God in the flesh, Jesus the Messiah, he shows up, lives his life perfectly. He died on a cross and then rose from the dead three days later, ascended into heaven. But while he was here, he started what we call the church, right? And we really see that begin to uh, sort of come to fruition in the book of Acts. And we have been living in, ever since Jesus' ascension, what we might call the church age, where God now has a relationship with the church. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter what color you are, what language you speak, what nation you're from. If you, by faith, accept Jesus as your Savior, you are invited into or welcomed into the family of God. You become a part of His church. That's what we're living right now. Now, we're waiting for what we might call the the eternal kingdom to be established, right? We mentioned this, I think it was last week, where Jesus is going to return, and his church is going to be caught up with him, and we will forever be with the Lord. There will be a short time of seven years on this earth called the tribulation. It's terrible. You're going to be glad that you're not here if you know Jesus, Um, And you can read about that in Revelation this afternoon if you want to have nightmares. Uh, Not really, because if you're a Christian, you're not going to be here, right? Uh, You're going to be with Jesus. But after those seven years, the Lord is going to return with his people to the earth, and he's going to establish his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years, like literally a thousand years. Well, then, then what happens after that? Well, then he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and we're going to move on into eternity. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. There's your summary of the whole Bible. Here's what's crazy about the Bible. You don't find any contradictions in the Bible. Remember, 40 men, 1,600 years, different continents, different languages. We don't have any contradictions here. Now, uh, I will admit there are what we might call some apparent contradictions. You might read something in one part and another part, and you go, whoa, wait a minute, that seems a little off. Um, When you study the Bible in context, one of two things will happen. Uh, the apparent contradiction becomes clearly not a contradiction at all in most cases. Uh, Sometimes we are left going, boy, I am not really sure. How do I reconcile that? And, and, And sometimes we're left with a doubt, a question. And we just sort of leave it there. We continue to read the Bible and study. And the more we learn, the more we grow. A lot of those things become resolved. Uh, Most of us in the room have been a Christian for a little while. You may even have a little list that you've got going. Questions I want to ask God, right? Maybe some of them are in the Bible. and You're like, hey, can you explain to me how in the world? Why did this happen? I can't believe. It's hard for me to imagine Can you give some more light to that? And we are settled and uh, are just waiting for the opportunity to be able to ask some of those questions of him. Well, here's what happens in the world that I live in, and I think probably you and you've probably had some of these discussions. Has anybody ever heard someone say, maybe you get into a conversation with a coworker or maybe somebody at school and you begin to talk about the Bible. Have you ever heard somebody say something like, well, you know, the Bible, it was written by men a really long time ago, and it's been corrupted, and it's been changed, and I mean, we can't really rely on that anymore. Anybody heard something like that before, right? Okay, or maybe several of you in the room, right? So then what do you do with that? Where, where do you go? You're like, wow, man, dude, I didn't know that. Thanks. <laughs> Well, we probably should have a better answer than that, right? And in fact, we actually do. And I want to help you with that for the next few minutes. This is like a little bit kind of like Bible nerdy time. And uh, like I live there. I love it, right? So hang with me for a minute. Some of this might actually help you have some of these conversations, not so that you can win an argument, but so that you can lovingly show someone, and listen, there's a, re- there's a reason. And there are many reasons, actually, why I believe that this is God's word and that it is textually preserved for us, and that it hasn't actually been changed and corrupted over thousands of years like you think. It's just not true. In fact, I would go so far as to say this, that either 
uh, the person who might say such a thing is either being dishonest or they're simply just ignorant of the facts. And, and maybe uh, that's some of us in the room. So let's become less ignorant this morning, okay? Um, and let me just talk to you about th- this, that we don't have, and this is true, we don't have truly any what are called autographs of the Bible. What's an autograph of the Bible? In other words, the actual pieces of paper or papyrus that Moses wrote on or that Paul wrote on, the actual letter that was hand-delivered to the church, uh, you know, in Rome or uh, to the Galatians. Like, we don't have those pieces of paper. Those are, at least they haven't been discovered yet, right? Um, But what we do have are many, and by many I mean into the thousands of copies of those letters, right? Copies of those letters. So, um, let, let me talk to you about that from an Old Testament perspective real quick, all right? Rules for copying, making copies of the Old Testament. So, you know, what Moses wrote down eventually got copied by other people. As you could imagine, uh, more than likely the thing that he wrote on uh, disintegrated by this time. Who knows? We may find it someday. But, but there were rules that the Jews had for making copies of God's Word. And they included things like it, the copies had to be done on certain pieces of paper. I mean, it had to be a, of a certain quality and kind of paper. The ink that they used had to be made from a very specific recipe uh, in order for them to write that. The, those who were going to make the copies had to cleanse themselves multiple times as they were making physical copies of the writing. Uh, They weren't allowed to copy anything from memory. In other words, they would have to have, uh, let's let's call it their their example that they were writing from, and they had to pronounce every single word before they wrote it down. They, They were not allowed to write anything down from memory, but they had to visually do that. Uh, very precisely. Uh, The papers that they wrote on had to be particularly lined. They measured from the edges of the paper so that everything fit within certain boundaries. There had to be a certain range of letters on every single line. And and you'll say it was between 20 and 24 letters uh, per line. And it's not those actual numbers, but whatever it was, they had to have a certain number of letters per line spaced just right, and the letters couldn't touch one another. Um, And they had to be a certain distance from each other. If in the process of making the copy, it would later have to be proofread by someone else. And if in proofreading the copy, one mistake was found on that page, then that page had to be discarded, and it had to be uh, redone. If three errors or more were found on the single page, then they didn't throw away the page. They threw away the entire document, and we had to start over. Uh, These are the kinds of things, and that list could go on and on and on about how meticulously they made copies of the Old Testament. Um, Rules for making copies of the New Testament. This one's going to be a lot easier. There weren't any. Wait, what? (laughs) Yeah, there there weren't any rules for making copies of of the New Testament. Here's what happened. Paul wrote a letter and went to the Ephesians. They read it and were like, this is awesome. We need to write this down and we need to take it to our neighbors. We need to send it to the church in the town next door to us. And they just started making copy after copy after copy. They couldn't help themselves. There really weren't any rules. They just made lots and lots and lots of copies of the letters that Paul wrote and Peter and so on. And so today we have lots and lots of copies. Well, here's what happens sometimes. As I mentioned to you, some people will think, well, they were corrupted, or they're so old, or maybe we don't really have that many. One of the interesting things I think about this is, um, how many of you have ever heard of a guy named Plato, right? Not the, not the gooey stuff you stretch and form into. Plato, right? Uh, I think a Greek philosopher. I think he lived, I'm going to show you on the screen here, a, a few hundred years before Christ, 347 maybe BC, before Christ. So Plato wrote some stuff down, right? And he gets quoted from time to time. Um, The earliest copies of his material, like we don't have anything that he actually wrote either, but we have copies of what he wrote. The earliest copies that we have uh, from him were actually dated to be about 900 AD. He lived in, let's say, 300 BC. So we have about a 1,200-year gap. He lived in the 300s before Christ. We have copies of his material 900 years after Christ. 
huge gap before we have any copies that were made. And in fact, we have 10 manuscripts of his. In other words, handwritten copies of what Plato wrote, not himself, but copies of those things. We have only 10 of those. Interesting, right? But, but yet today we would quote him and say, well, you know, Plato said, Plato believed because we have historical records, right? There was a guy named Tacitus. Tacitus was considered to be, and still is to this day actually, probably the greatest Roman historian of his era and maybe ever. He lived around 100 AD. The earliest copies of things that he wrote are from 1100 AD, so again, a, a thousand year gap between his life and what he wrote and the copies that we have of his. And we have about 20 of those manuscripts. Anybody read Homer's Iliad, right? Some of you students over here, Homer, you heard of him. Uh, similar kind of thing, 90 BC, earliest copies, several hundred years later. Now we have 643 of these, right? I mean, we have a lot right, compared to anything else. And we read Homer's Iliad, and we assume we're actually reading his story, right? In comparison, when we want to talk about, let's limit this to the New Testament right now. The New Testament was completed in about 90 AD when John wrote the book of Revelation. Um, the earliest copies, now this wouldn't be an entire copy of the New Testament, but we have fragments, we have pieces of documents with the Bible handwritten on them, um, date back to about 125 AD. So really like 30, 35 years after the last writing was actually written by John himself. Uh, a gap that goes from hundreds, if not a thousand years, down to about 30 years from the time that it was originally written, we have copies that were being made. In fact, we don't have just a couple of those copies. We have upwards of 24,000 copies of the New Testament. Some of them are entire copies of the New Testament. Some of them are books in and of themselves or several books or fragments of them. In fact, what, what those who are educated in this field of textual criticism, not just about the Bible, but any historical text would say, in fact, someone has said, when it comes to the Bible, we have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the manuscript evidence for what we have in our hands today. In other words, we have so many copies that we can go back to and look and go, wow, this is amazing that we have so much time later exactly what was written originally by the apostles and Moses and others. Um, some would say, well, but there are a lot of differences between those copies. And, and there's no doubt that there are some differences. Uh, but when you talk about a lot of differences, by the way, if you've read the Bible, if you notice it's kind of, kind of thick, it's kind of a big book, a lot of words in it. And, and some would even say, well, there are thousands of differences between these copies that we have. Well, they're not wrong. Um, if you want to count like a spelling of two different words, or of the same word, is just spelled differently, they would say, oh, that's a difference. Well, we know what the word is. It was just spelled with two ends instead of one in, in one location or another. When you add those up, there may be thousands. The reality is that the Greek manuscripts that we have are 99.5% in agreement with one another, like word for word. And, and the ones that we have, in fact, most of the differences are either spelling issues or they're not even translatable into the English language. It would be sort of like a difference of having a Spanish word with an accent on it. And when you go to translate that into English, it doesn't have an accent because we don't use accent marks, right? That would, be, that would be something that's not even translatable into our languages. Essentially, um, we have everything that God wrote for us just exactly like we need. Not a sense. We have it. Um, the variances that we have are very easy, and their decisions between, is it this word or this word? Do we spell it this way or this way? So here's the bottom line to all of this portion of the message. It is textually preserved, is this, that if you can't trust the accuracy of the Bible, then you cannot trust the accuracy of any ancient piece of literature on the planet. You, you would have to take it all and just throw it all away. Now, no one is willing to do that, uh, Non-Christians are not willing to do that either with, with other documents. But to be fair, that's what you would have to do. There is more documentary evidence that the Bible is 
as it was originally written than any other ancient piece of literature. So when you're in a conversation with someone, and again, this isn't about winning an argument. It's about understanding what you hold in your hands. You have an amazing document that came from God. It came by the Holy Spirit who used men to write it down. It's all about our relationship with Jesus, and we have exactly what we're supposed to have as God had given it to us because it is textually preserved. Can you trust the Bible? Yeah, what you have is an accurate copy of God's word in your hands. Well, we need to move on. It is also historically proven. The word of God is historically proven. Now, what I mean by that is that it is proven to be historically accurate, right? So uh, the Old Testament, and I'm just going to kind of pick up where we were talking about a minute ago. How many of you have heard of something called the Dead Sea Scrolls? Anybody? The Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of you have. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, let me, let me say it this way, and, and really this sort of ties into the, the previous point, but it was a historical moment, so I want to share this with you. Um, until 1947, the, the oldest copy that we had of, of the Old Testament was dated at about 900 years after Christ. Does that make sense? The oldest copy, of, the handwritten copy of the Old Testament that we had was dated to about 900 years after Christ. In 1947, um, in Israel, there was a Bedouin shepherd boy uh, looking for a, a sheep that he had lost. And as he was wandering and looking, uh, the story goes, and it's a real story, uh, it's not fictional, um, he threw a stone into a cave that he saw in this, I guess, cliff near, on the west side of the Dead Sea. And as the stone entered into the, the cave, he heard some, something that sounded like maybe pottery shattering. And so he went up to investigate, and what he found in this cave were lots of um, clay pots and jars that were stuffed with all kinds of different, different scrolls. Um, and so he went and talked to whoever he needed to talk to. I don't know if he put it on Facebook or Instagram or what. But uh, So then, you know, all the media showed up to go check this out, and all the experts... Uh, they gathered all this stuff up, um, and particularly what they found of great interest to us is an, an entire handwritten copy of the book of Isaiah. Uh, this book of Isaiah was dated around 125 B.C. So, uh, and what they found was that the accuracy from the book of Isaiah from 125 B.C., to what we previously had, 900 AD, so a thousand years. We went backward in time, a thousand years on the copies of the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Isaiah. And what they found is the discrepancy between the oldest copy and the one that we had were three letters that were different. Um, easy to figure out what was going on there. So we went back a thousand years in time and found out, oh man, we have exactly the same thing. There's no question. In other words, the, the word had been transmitted and translated and preserved just like it should have been. And that was proven historically in 1947 with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Archaeology over time continues to affirm what we read about in the Old and New Testament. We have now evidence uh, of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and how they were actually destroyed. Like, like scientifically, they've, they've unearthed it, and we have evidence that it aligns with what Scripture says. They have found the city of Jericho and the walls that had fallen down. We have evidence, archaeologically speaking, of David and Solomon and Saul and others and many of the Old Testament cities and towns. Um, if you've read the Old Testament, you read about a group of people there called the Hittites. The Hittites, right? Remember that name? They're mentioned over 50 times in the Bible. Uh, for years... Archaeologists and historians treated the Hittites as proof that the Bible was really just a, a collection of mythological stories because they hadn't found any evidence of a people group mentioned over 50 times in the Bible as the Hittites in the Middle East. No evidence whatsoever. So they just assumed, obviously, you know, these old Jewish guys were just making up stories and passing them down from generation to generation until 1876. And since then, many discoveries have confirmed that the Hittites were actually a very powerful people in that region during the 15th and 16th centuries before 
Christ. Historians, Christian and none, um, are arguing that what we have in the Bible is an accurate historical record of what God has done with his people. Uh, Nelson Gluck, a Jewish archaeologist, said, it may be stated categorically that there are no archaeological discoveries that have ever controverted a biblical reference. In other words, we have no way archaeologically to go, no, that didn't happen. All right? Now, there are things that we can't prove have happened yet because we haven't found that. But we haven't found anything that, that controverted what the Bible said. In the New Testament, uh, we would consider Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, to be primary sources that would tell us about the life of Jesus Christ. No doubt about that. By the way, those are considered to be not just biblical books. Those are books of history. Right? I mean, each of those guys that wrote that down, uh, the documentary evidence is that those have to be considered as legitimate pieces of histor- historical documents. But did, I don't know if you knew this. Um, I'd heard this before and was kind of reminded as I was prepping for this again, that outside of the Bible, outside of the Bible, here's what can be learned about, about Jesus um, from non-Christian sources. Jesus was from Nazareth. We know that from non-Christians writing about uh, that area of the world and mentions that Jesus was from Nazareth. He lived a wise and virtuous life. Uh, He was crucified in Palestine under Pontius Pilate. Again, this isn't the Bible. This is outside of the Bible, confirming essentially what the Bible says. He was believed by his disciples to have resurrected on the third day. So whoever wrote that, they're not saying he resurrected, but what they are saying is his disciples at least believed that he resurrected three days later, which would make sense since he did. His enemies acknowledged that he performed unusual feats that they called sorcery. Uh, We know them as miracles, right? But if you're not a believer, you're trying to figure out what is this? What is this magic that's happening? Well, it's the Son of God doing miracles. Uh, He did things that they didn't understand. His small band of disciples multiplied rapidly. They spread as far as Rome. His disciples denied polytheism, and they lived moral lives and worshiped Christ as divine didn't it just sound like I was just telling you the story of the life of Jesus? That, that's what was known about him outside of the Bible. Not to mention, obviously, what we have in Scripture. And the more that we discover, the more that we see confirmation of the Bible's historical accuracy. Uh, we really don't have any reason whatsoever to doubt when we read this that these are historical uh, events that happen in time. So the Bible is historically proven. It's also scientifically accurate. Now this is one uh, that I think would probably raise questions in people's minds for sure. Uh, I want to say this, the Bible is not a science book, right? But when it does speak about science, it speaks accurately. And that's the point. It's scientifically accurate. Uh, Contrary to what some may think, science and the Bible are not enemies, right? Do you ever feel that way? Has anybody ever felt that way? I mean, don't you feel like that sometimes? Like there's this, you know, uh, I don't know, competition between science and the Bible. Uh, that's really not the case if, if the Bible is true and if, the science, if science actually discovers truth, then truth and truth match, right? So science and the Bible aren't at odds. They're not enemies. Now, they arrive at different conclusions at times, and then we have to figure out what to do. Um, While there is much debate, even amongst Christians, about the correct interpretation of, let's say, some of the details of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, I found it interesting uh, to consider that both the Bible and, and for the most part, science now agree that the universe had a beginning. Right? We, we read that and we go, well, of course it did. God, you know, in the beginning, created the heaven and the earth. Scientists for years did not want to believe that the universe had a beginning because if it had a beginning, then what would that mean? Well, then, yeah, but well, then who did that? Who made that? Where'd the stuff come from, right? And, and now, for the most part, there's still some debate about this, but renowned scientists are now claiming, no, it, it did have a beginning, Now, they call it the Big Bang, right? Um, We may read that a little differently, but it's interesting that at least we both are agreeing that the universe did have a beginning. Scientists haven't always believed that. 
um, because of what would seem to be the next logical c- conclusion that God must have started that. Uh, unless, if you remember last week, remember I quoted to you, unless you believe it just sort of popped into existence from nothing for nothing, uh, which now seems to step outside of the realm of science, and we have what we call the faith of an atheist that just believes this must have happened this way because we just don't have any other explanation. Um, and so now we see both science and Christianity even have an element of faith. Faith and reason, they go together, right? The Bible teaches that the earth is suspended in space. If you were to read Job chapter 26 and verse 7, that's what it says. It says the earth is just hanging there. There's nothing supporting him. Just ha- Job, we're talking way back in history. They had no idea of the knowledge and the things that we have seen now with the Hubble Space Telescope and so many other images that we see from NASA. They, they couldn't see what we have seen, and yet uh, Job, inspired by the Spirit of God working through him, says, you know, the earth is just kind of hanging out there in space. We don't have an explanation right now, but we know that God has placed it there. This Bible speaks accurately in Job chapter 36 about the water cycle that happens on our planet. When I say accurately, again, I'm not saying it speaks in every detail. It just speaks accurately. It's not wrong. It's not in error. It just mentions it in passing. It's not a science book, but when it mentions science, it is scientifically accurate. The Bible speaks of an innumerable number of stars and that each star is unique. You can find that in multiple places in the Bible. Uh, Really going back not too many years in light of all of human history, maybe hundreds of years, the the best scientists of the day were saying, I think I've counted 1,056 stars. And somebody else was saying, well, no, I think there's, you know, 1,732 stars. They thought that they were seeing all the stars. If they'd read the Bible, they would have known, uh, dude, you're way off. Like, we can't even count all those I, can't, I don't know the numbers that they're saying now. I think they're saying there's something like 100 billion just in our galaxy or, or something like that. I mean, you know, it's just astronomical. We can't really count them. We're estimating them, just like the Bible said. The Bible speaks accurately about meteorology and hydrology in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The Bible describes the importance of blood to human life. The life is in the blood. Oh, we knew it. We just couldn't figure it out. But yeah, something about that blood, and we could go on and on and on. Uh, So what happens, really, when science and the Bible disagree? Maybe I should say scientists and the Bible disagree. Science, like, it's not its its own person, right? Uh, But when it seems like we have what we believe is true and real, and it disagrees with what the Bible... I I can just tell you, for me personally, um, there's just too much evidence, not just scientifically, historically, textually, and I could go on and on. There's just too much evidence for me to conclude the Bible's wrong. I mean, it's just been proven right over and over and over and over. And so usually when there's a discrepancy, I assume one of two things. Either the science is not good yet, we're getting there, but it's just not good yet, or perhaps my understanding of what God says needs to be reconsidered right? But what we know about science is what? Man, science evolves. I mean, it's, it's changing. Like, we, we've had bad thoughts about reality based on science that had to change over time, and that continues to happen. So let me just reiterate as we begin to wrap up here. There's really no competition here. Uh, we're arriving at truth scientifically, hopefully, and when it agrees with the Bible, which it often, most often does, Uh, we're in a good place. When it doesn't, I would say, don't be quick to throw out what has been proven time and time and time and time again. Uh, We'll get there eventually, hopefully, if Jesus tarries his return scientifically. Let me finish this way. It is practically relevant. Why can you trust the Bible? Because it is practically relevant. So we've been kind of, you know, heady a little bit this morning. But practically speaking, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for example, says that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible is alive, and it speaks to you today, just like it spoke to people a 100 years ago, a 1,000 years ago, and 2,000 years ago, and on and on. 
It's amazing how the Bible speaks into our lives right here, right now, and the relevance is uncanny. It's profitable. We already read the book, uh, read the verse in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, right? It's, pr- it's given by God and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and in righteousness so that we can be fully equipped to do the things that God has asked us to do. It speaks wisely and helpfully about marriage. It teaches us how to raise our children. It helps us to handle stress and anxiety. It talks to us about friendships and forgiveness and holiness and healthiness. And it could go, we could go on and on about the practical nature of God's word. But most importantly, it gives us ultimate hope. And that hope is in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Bible teaches us and explains that the reason for all the trouble that we've ever experienced in the world ultimately is the sin of mankind. It teaches that our sin separated us from a holy and a just and a loving God. But God, in his love for us, sent Jesus, his son, into the world to take our sin upon himself. And the scripture says that the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus took our death upon himself on a cross. And he died in our place for our sin so that through faith in him, we could be forgiven by this holy and loving God so that we could be brought into a relationship with him so that we would be welcomed into his family for this lifetime. And oh, the hope is so much more. It's beyond this lifetime. It's forevermore. Jesus did that for us by dying on the cross. And so the scripture says very plainly that if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, if we'll believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. Saved from sin, saved from death, saved from hell. And we will enter a relationship with him. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? I'd like to pray with you today. I want to remind you as we just close our eyes and sort of ponder the things that we've heard today from God's word and we've, we've considered about him and what he's done and what he's given us. You can trust the Bible. What we've tried to do today is is consider why. Give you some assurance and give you some confidence both from what God says, from what we've discovered. Not so that you can win an argument, but so that you can boldly live out the life that Jesus has called you to live and that you can stand assured when you converse with family, friends, coworkers, people you go to school with. And you can know, yes, you have faith in Jesus But it's not a blind faith. It's a faith with reasons. Ultimately, we need both. So I don't know where you are today. I'm I'm wondering, maybe, is there someone in the room that you would say, oh man, Alan, I have lots of questions. Maybe they're scientific. Maybe they're historic. Maybe they're textual. Maybe they're just practical. Alan, there are some things going on in my life that I don't understand. And I want to believe that what God says is true. There was a man in scripture who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So I'm wondering, is there anybody in the room today that would sort of have that prayer to the Lord today? Hey, I believe, but help my unbelief. I'm going through some some things I need help with. And maybe today you'd just be honest enough to say, I don't understand them, but but I know I need help from the Lord. And, And today... I want to pray for that. Is that you? Are you there? If that's you, raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you, not by name. I just want to to pray out loud over you. Okay, several of you in the room, right? Father, I just want to thank you for um, giving us your truth. Thank you for giving us your spirit. Thank you for Jesus coming to die on the cross for us. 
Thank you for the assurance that we have because of the work of the Spirit in our lives. And, and thank you because, Lord, you've given us minds to think and ponder and meditate and investigate the world that you have created. And thank you, Father, because when all of those things agree, we have a peace. We have the ability to share with others not only the faith that we have, but the world that you've created and why. All of it, Lord, is to point to Jesus as our greatest need, as our hope, as our peace, and as our joy. Lord, there's nothing we can do outside of, outside of your grace, outside of your love, outside of your mercy to earn favor with you. So Lord, for those that would say today, man, I, I've got some things going on I don't understand and I know I need help. I pray that you would help them. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that you would increase their faith and their confidence and their assurance in you. And we could live the lives you've called us to live. And Lord, if there's anyone in the room today that has not given their life to Jesus, who's not repented of their sin and trusted him and him alone for their salvation, I pray that today, right now, would be the moment where they choose you. They choose you over everything, every idea, every hope, every dream. Lord, they choose you for salvation, for forgiveness. Lord, you are the only way. Father, thank you for the life that we have in Christ. I pray that as we leave here, we would leave boldly, ready to share, looking for opportunities to testify of your goodness, your grace, and your love. Father, we love you. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for being here today. Man, I tell you, I'm, I'm so thankful for what God has given us in his word. And um, I know there's so much more we could talk about. Um, and as you wrestle with questions, man, I tell you, I've got my own. And I know I can speak for Pastor Justin, myself, and others. We just love to continue to have those conversations so that we can work through those things and see that God is always true. He's always right. He's always good. And he has given us a great treasure in his word. And it's on his word that we bank our very lives and eternity. Uh, let me mention a couple of things to you before you head out the door today. One, if you filled out a Connect card or, uh, or brought an offering today, you can drop those in the buckets on the way out. And we will gather those. We will pray for you and uh, help you take whatever next step you might have. Um, in your spiritual journey. One of those might be that you'd want to join us next week for Discover One Life. Uh, we'll be meeting over the next few weeks, and, and uh, if you'll let us know that you want to come to that, we will send out some information to you. We'll meet right here on our campus, um, and we'll send you the time. It'll probably be, uh, I'm going to say 9.15 uh, right here, and we will just talk about what, what God's doing here, how you can be a part of that, how you can love and grow and serve um, and, and take the next steps that God would want you to take, whether that's uh, baptism or membership or getting involved in a life group. We'll talk through all of that uh, over the next few weeks in our Discover One Life um, group. So let us know you want to be a part of that. You can do that on the Connect card or maybe in a link that comes up if you're listening online. Um, or you can call the office early this week and we'll get you set up there, all right? Hey, listen, love you guys. Thanks for being here today. Let's all stand to our feet. Have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you back next week.